All right. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining. Uh, while we are still uh, having people joining at a very fast pace, uh, I, I believe that in the interest of time, let's go ahead and start the seminar. So uh, today we have two very exciting talks. Uh, first, we are going to have uh, Nicholas Boomer, uh, who is going to tell us about robustness in elections and in participatory budgeting. And then later we'll have uh, Jugal Gurg. After the breakout room uh, session, we'll have Jugal Gurg telling us a bit more about fair division and some recent excite, uh, exciting developments in finding uh, fair and efficient allocations of indivisible goods. So uh, don't want to take too much time because we are always kind of running short of time. So uh, Nicholas, over to you. So I hope you can, can see my screen. Um, okay, great. So yeah, thanks for the introduction and also thanks for the invitation. I'm very excited to speak about today about a series of works on robustness in elections and participatory budgeting. So as the title maybe already suggests, this talk will have two parts. The first one will be about elections and it's based on an Ichka and an Yamo paper. And the second one will be a bit shorter about participatory budgeting, which is based on a working paper. And yeah, so all authors are listed here. So this is joint work together with Robert, Piot, Lukas, Andre, and Rolf. And to just to, to be on the same page when I speak of elections in the following, I will always mean single winner elections, where we are given a set of candidates and voters with strict preferences of our candidates. Uh, so no ties, kind of the classical single winner setting. And I will mostly be interested in scoring based voting rules. So where we are given an election and a scoring vector and simply each voter awards as I many points to the candidate ranks in ith place and we sum up all the points for all the voters or so kind of everything very normal, very classic. And the, the question about which this talk is, is how to measure the robustness of election winners. Um, or alternatively, you could frame this also by how much did an election winner won the election. So we want to get a feeling for the robustness and the lead of the winner, which are kind of two different perspectives on, on more or less the same issue. And if we are speaking about scoring versus voting rules, then the first thing that one what probably comes to mind here is to simply look at the scores and calculate the difference between the score of the winner and the guy rank in second place, which feels like a very natural quantification of the, the gap or the lead of the winner. Slightly more involved in, in, in previous works, uh, the cost of a minimum uh, destructive, or the minimum cost of a destructive swap bribery has been proposed. What I mean by this is basically what the idea here is that we count the minimum number of changes that are necessary to change the, the outcome of the election. And the kind of allowed changes that we uh, that we can make here are so-called swaps. And what I mean by a swap is always that I look at some votes and I swap adjacent candidates in this vote. So for example, I look at the first candidate in this vote and the second candidate, and then I reverse them. So the second one becomes first and the other way around. And if you look at this minimum, so the minimum number of such swaps such as the winner changes then gives us also a slightly different estimate of the robustness or the lead of the, uh, of the election winner. And at the beginning of this project, we ask ourselves, how do these two uh, notions relate to each other? And actually, we found them to be highly correlated. So here, each, each of these points corresponds to one election. So this is a diverse data set of 800 elections. The details don't really matter here. Uh, but what matters is on the x-axis, we have the cost of the bribery. And on the y-axis, we have the score difference. And we see kind of a very yeah, high linear correlation between these two measures. So maybe, yeah, the, the question has been answered and the talk is over now, but uh, it's not uh, because we, we, we started thinking a bit more about what the score difference and the minimum cost of a destructive swap bribery actually corresponds to and means. And we noticed that both of them are kind of assuming that we have full control over the input and that we can make adversarial changes. And what I mean by this is, for example, for, for this destructive swap bribery kind of thing, um, we just ask, is there a sequence of L swaps? So we just want one sequence of minimum length such that the winner changes but we don't really care about how many of the sequences there are we just ask is there at least one and this is then sufficient to say okay this is the robustness of the election winner and we found this to be a bit unrealistic so if we are thinking about real world changes so how voters would change their mind in real world they certainly wouldn't change it exactly how we want them to uh, and this is why the mission of this talk was, or the mission of, of this work is to measure the robustness of election winners to random noise. So where we assume that basically each, each swap in each possible swap in the preferences happens with the same probability. So we don't make any kinds of assumptions and just assume some changes will happen, but what changes is kind of, yeah, up, up, up to the model. 
And we believe that kind of understanding this robustness of election winners to random noise is also important for practical or real world applications. Because first of all, if we can quantify the robustness or the lead of an election winner, then this influences its legitimacy or credibility. So if we have a kind of a large gap, um, then maybe, I mean, for example, in the political context, people always say if it was a close election, then they don't have a mandate to make any radical decisions. Uh, whereas if it was, if it's kind of was a very, very large lead, then they can also make more fundamental changes to the, I don't know, constitution or something like this. And secondly, there's also more radical view on the sole robustness aspect. This is if we assume that the case casted votes only capture reality approximately. So if there, I don't know, were some errors in the vote elicitation process, or we, we assume that there are some random factors uh, which which play into a, or which which influence the votes but shouldn't for example i don't know uh, whether in us elections i think if it's bad whether it's favorable for republicans or something like this uh, so if we adopt this view then actually if we um, if we detect an election that is close or non robust then this even requires initiation of active countermeasures like re-elections or recounts and overall we hope that kind of by understanding this lead aspect or the robustness of an election winner better we increase the fairness and transparency of the whole process so let me now start by kind of giving you a feeling for what we mean by these random changes and how one could could measure the winning probabilities because this will a lot be about winning probabilities of candidates when we start to make some changes. So traditionally, as said, we or people previously have used um, or have suggested to use to be a bit more precise, this destructive sub primary problem, which just asks, is there a way to prevent some candidate from winning after performing L swaps of adjacent candidates? And now we move from this decision problem. So this ask is kind of a yes no question. We now move to a counting problem and no longer ask, is it possible, but how many ways are there? So how many ways are there to make L swaps of adjacent candidates such that P is a winner? And this question, if we could answer this, already um, gives us kind of a good intuition for the robustness, because what we can do is we can simply take the answer to this question. So for some, some random number of swaps that we want to perform, uh, so for some noise level, um, we just take the answer to this question and divide it by the, all the possible elections at swap distance L. So kind of all, um, we, we count all the, the, the swaps, the, the sequences of length L we can make where P wins and divide this by all possible sequences. And by this, we kind of immediately get the winning probability that P wins, assuming that we make L swaps or that we sample an election at swap distance L. And now kind of if we would increase this swap distance and observe the winning probabilities of the candidates, this would then give us an intuition for the robustness of, of the election winner. Unfortunately, though, it turns out that solving this problem exactly is computationally intractable, even for plurality, uh, which is why we used some, a slightly different approach. Um, but before I will go into detail here, I just want to briefly mention that we are not the first, of course, to look at counting problems in Comsoc, although these types of problems are relatively rare. So counting problems haven't been of, so often studied in the past, uh, which is a bit unfortunate because I think they are fun from a theoretical perspective. And um, as argued, they are sometimes also capturing a bit more realistic aspects and decisions problems. The main three settings that have been studied are, first of all, counting extensions of incomplete votes. So if we assume that votes are incomplete, uh, so this is kind of a counting analog to these possible necessary winner type of questions. Uh, then there are some very general models where we assume that each voter has its own probability distribution over votes and just draws from this. And they are also counting analogs or counting variants of control problems compared to the, um, yeah, compared to the bribery problems that we look at here. Okay, but now what, what do we do uh, in our experiments? Um, so how do we assess now the robustness of real world election winners? And the answer here is that we use some, some established noise models. So the Mellows noise model, I won't go into too much detail here because I don't have time, but how this basically works is that we have a global parameter of, of which you could think of as the perturbation level or noise level or something like this. Um, and we have this global parameter and what we do is we go through the votes one by one and always perturb it using this uh, Mellows noise model with the parameter. So basically making some, some random number of swaps in this vote proportional um, to the parameter. And then we do this for all votes. We look at the winner and then we repeat this 10,000 times and we record the average winning probabilities of the candidates. And this gives us then plots like this. So these line plots here, each of these lines corresponds to one candidate. So here red, blue, um, and the red one is here the initial winner. So on the x-axis, we have the level of perturbation. So left is kind of original election, right means many, many swaps have been performed. And on the y-axis, we have the winning probability. So yeah, I said here the red one is the initial winner. So it initially has winning probability 100%. And now by yeah, by observing how or by, by analyzing how quickly this line drops, so how quickly the winning probability of the original election winner decreases, we can get an in, uh, kind of get an estimate for the robustness of this election winner. And so this is this is one perspective. Uh, 
based on this, sometimes it's also helpful to just have a single number for each instance. Um, for this, we propose the so-called 50% winner threshold, which is simply the smallest perturbation level for which the winner's winning probability uh, drops below 50%. So below this is kind of still in the majority of cases, the winner still wins. And after coming up with this, the first question that we asked ourselves was, okay, did we now establish a new perspective or is this the score difference all over again? And the answer is, at least if you look at this, it's kind of, I would say relatively different from, from what has been out there before, because again, here we see this is again a correlation plot. So each of these points corresponds to an election. We put some points like this here, because otherwise they would, I mean, if they would otherwise overlap. Um, and what we see here is uh, a 50% winner threshold on the x-axis, score difference on the y-axis. And I mean, there is some kind of correlation in there, but especially for a low score difference, basically everything can happen from the perspective of the 50% winner threshold. So for a score difference of five, it could be that if we have a 50% winner threshold of 0 0.1, which means already three random swaps can change the election winner, or also 0 0.8, which means we really, really need many, many, many swaps uh, to change the election winner in the majority of cases. And we did these experiments, so this is all synthetic data, uh, but we also looked at different types of real world data sources, and I just want to speak about one here in the interest of time, and this is Formula One World Championships, uh, because they kind of gave the most interesting uh, results. Uh, so here in Formula One World Championships, we, we looked at different editions, and in each edition we have a set of drivers competing in multiple races, and we can see this as an election where we kind of have drivers as the candidate and the race as the voters, and then kind of each race ranks the the drivers or the candidates in the finishing time or in the, in the order in which they finished in this race. And this is actually also in some sense, at least the way or the view that the Formula One organization adopts, uh, because they then apply really a scoring based voting rule to compute uh, the, the overall winner. So to aggregate the outcome of the races into one overall winner. And these are kind of the scoring vectors actually they have changed over the years that they used, but for example, in 2000, between 2010 and 18, you got 25 points if you won a race. And yeah, the, the, the driver with the highest number of pays, uh, points then in the end is, becomes the world champion. And we now performed or executed our robustness analysis on, on these uh, 38 Formula One elections and found actually that in quite numerous of them, the winning probability of the original winner drops quite substantially. And I will now give six examples, which are interestingly of different kind of flavors, but yeah, um, I will get into more detail on this now. So here we have two elections from 1994 and 1988. Um, here always on top are the scores, so the number of points they got. And we always really use the original rule that they also used in, in, the, in this year of the Formula One edition. And what we see here is uh, the winning probability, so the red one is the initial winner, and its winning probability quickly decreases. So we just make few random swaps and already after, um, yeah, after we make some of these, um, the, the winning probability of the blue guy who was originally only second now is higher than the pro winning probability of the red candidate. To give you some, some intuition for how quickly this change here happened, um, if we make on average the full election around five swaps, remind, a reminder, so the election has roughly 20 voters, 20 candidates, and we look at the full election, we make five swaps uniformly at random, and this changes the winner already with 22% probability. And most of these swaps won't even affect the red or the blue winner because there are naturally also a lot of other candidates. And we believe that these kinds of examples, or if, if, you, if you see pictures like this, then you could even claim that the winner was more winning by luck or by accident in these types of elections than by true merit. Because in most of elections, or if, if you look at this election and if you look at the surroundings, so all the elections which are close, which have a small swap distance to, to the original one, in most of the surrounding, actually someone else would have won. And if we now assume that we the original election came into place via some, I don't know, random process, then actually most likely other outcomes of this random process would have had a different winner. So this is really, in some sense, concerning or alarming if you have, or could interpret this as concerning or alarming if you have such situ situations like this. Furthermore, there also exist other examples or other types, um, as I mentioned. So here we have, again, the winning probability of the original election winner quickly drops. So just few random swaps are sufficient to change the outcome in a significant fraction of cases. But now here, the, the, the kind of the winning probability of the original can winner becomes very close to and stays also very close to, to, the, to the probability of the candidate ranked in second place. So here, instead of overtaking the second, so this, instead of the second one overtaking the original winner, here it's kind of more like a tight situation. So one might have considered this election to be tight in the begin with. And lastly, oh no, sorry, yeah. And uh, so just to give one more number here. So in this election from 2007, actually just making one swap uniformly at random in the full election already changed the outcome with 5.6% probability. 
again, as a reminder, most of these swaps won't affect uh, the red candidate or the blue or the black one, which always count into the kind of the winning probability of the red candidate because then nothing gets changed. I actually couldn't believe this number uh, to, when well, once my or initially when my program gave me this, I couldn't believe this and I really calculated it or checked it by hand. And it's really like this. And we were quite surprised that such unrobust winners um, actually appear in reality. And the third type is um, in, in some in some situations, in some elections, you have quickly dropping winning probabilities here. So here also a few random changes can actually have a substantial influence, but nevertheless, the red winner stays the most probable winner for quite some time. So here one can say, okay, it was a bit fragile, but still the red one is clearly the strongest candidate out there. And this now concludes the first half um, on elections. And in the remaining five minutes, I want to speak about participatory budgeting. And I will use kind of a standard approval-based model. So um, we have a budget, we have project with costs, and we have voters which specify arbitrary subsets of projects or approve arbitrary subsets of projects. And then voting rule-wise, I will focus on greedy AV, which just considers the projects one by one in non-increasing order of the received approvals. Um, and then always select the project if there's enough, uh, enough funds left, and if not, then it goes over to the next project. And we believe that in the context of participatory budgeting, uh, studying the robustness or um, assuming the changes might happen is actually maybe even more realistic because there are two distinct features of these elections, which makes them particularly subjective to change. Um, and this is, first of all, there exist many projects. So we used real world data from, um, from the Pabolib platform in our experiments. And there, there are numerous instances with like 30 plus, 50 plus type of projects. So one could argue that voters might not probably be aware of all of them. So if we would just inform them about more, probably their votes also would change. Um, and only very few residents vote, roughly between 5 and 10% usually in these participatory budgeting elections. So the set of voters overall is a bit shaky. Okay, and now we can do a very similar approach um, compared to what we have did earlier. Now, instead of performing arbitrary swaps, so to, to instead of swapping adjacent candidates in some votes, we now perform flips. What I mean by flip is simply that I turn one approval into a disapproval or one disapproval into approval for some candidate voter pair. And again, we adopt some, some noise model from the literature here. So the resampling noise model, um, which basically uh, yeah, resamples each approval with probability R percent. So R percent is now kind of our, our perturbation level from earlier. And again, we do this. So we resample each approval with probability R percent, look at, okay, which, which are the projects who get funded if we apply greedy AV to this. And we repeat this project, uh, this process 1000 times and then record the average funding probabilities of the projects. And then we get here like plots analogous to the plots that we have earlier, like here on the right. So on the x-axis, we have the resampling probability. On the y-axis, we have the funding probability. Each line now corresponds to one, one project. And kind of left means original instance. And if you move further and further to the right, we introduce more and more noise. And here, what is already quite remarkable is that the pink project, the winning probability or the funding probability of the pink projects drops pretty, pretty quickly. Um, to quantify this, we have here, if we roughly flip around 0.024% of all approvals, the winning probability is already only 77.4%. And if we do 10 times this, so flip on average 0.24% of all approvals, the pink one actually loses in a, or get, not, not gets funded in the majority of cases. And in situations like this, I think one could even again claim that maybe this pink project was more funded by luck or funded by accident than by true merit. You could now ask, okay, why did you do the sampling approach? Couldn't you also do the, the counting bribery style of, of thing again? And the answer, yes, we also looked at this. So we could, um, the relevant computational problem here would now be to count the number of ways to flip K approvals to fund a given project. Unfortunately, it turns again out that this is computationally interactable. In this case, even just for a single voter, if we use in the case of greedy AV. And uh, yeah, this is why we used our, our sampling um, sampling based approach. And as I said, we did different experiments on real world data from Pabu, uh, from Pabulib. So this is also a real world uh, instance of participatory budgeting that, that happened at some Polish city, which I cannot pronounce. Uh, and I just want to just uh, give you in the remaining two minutes a br brief uh, outlook or a brief glimpse on our experimental results, because um, interestingly, we, we discovered certain parallels in these robustness plots compared to the single winner case. So in the single winner case, as a, as a reminder, we had the situation that we had actually a tie or where I claimed that the, the, the candidates would have rather, should have rather seen as, as being tied winners. And here we have a very similar situation on the left, where the winning probability of different projects very quickly goes to 50%. So maybe one should rather have considered them as being kind of tied. 
And on the right, we see an instance. Um, so for um, so for participatory budgeting, the instance is the interactions between projects become more complex. And here now, even different types of non-robust projects can appear in the same instance. For example, here the blue one is very non-robust. Here maybe one could claim one more by luck or got funded by luck. The purple one is an instance of uh, this should have rather maybe is kind of on the edge, more like a tie case. And the red one shows here no, non-monotonic um, non behavior. First drops in winning probability or funding probability and then decreases again. And this one is kind of more, maybe, maybe it's fine to fund it, right? This one should uh, yeah, ex examine the situation um, once more separately. And we also did uh, looked at other rules. So for example, some proportional rules like mean and method of equal shares. I don't have time to define them. Uh, in the kind of the one line summary of the experiments here is that proportional rules, the, the whole situation gets more chaotic. So yeah, as you can see here, the project interactions um, yeah, are much more subtle here, which is also quite natural because these rules are a bit more clever in what they are doing and also having other objectives than for example, VDAV. Um, but yeah, here you have even, even less robust founding decisions in certain instances. So to sum up, I've hopefully conveyed three messages. The first message is look out for counting problems because they are fun from a theoretical perspective. And I believe that they sometimes capture reality better than the corresponding decision problems. Uh, then at least when it comes to these average, no, uh, the robust robustness notions, worst case notions typically have only a loose connection to the average case or to random changes. And the third message is that in different types of, exp uh, like in different types of instances, settings, rebuild outcomes are sometimes surprisingly, bearingly non-robust to random changes, even to extent that we were kind of a bit surprised about this. Um, there are multiple directions for future work. I just meant, want to mention three very briefly here. First of all, it would be very interesting in the context of the single winner kind of stuff to look at really high stakes political elections. Unfortunately, we usually don't elicit the full preference of the voters here, here, which makes the whole approach a bit infeasible. We already looked at some poll data, but expanding on this would be interesting. Then this whole robustness approach might also serve as a possibility to break ties in single winner elections. For example, if we have multiple initial election winners and they're actually their winning probability might behave very differently if we start to make some random changes. And lastly, you can also extend this whole approach to your own favorite collective decision-making problem, for example, stable matching, fair locations. And yeah, so with this, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Niklas, for that uh, really uh, engaging presentation. So there have already been, oh, yes. Uh, let's uh, take some time to unmute and uh, applaud. All right. Uh, so there have already been some questions, and Piotr has been doing a great job already answering uh, many of those questions. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I guess like some of the questions that, that were left a bit open-ended, I guess you can also share your thoughts. Uh, so uh, I guess all of the questions are somewhat open-ended, right? So I think we do have time, so might as well go through them and share your thoughts. So uh, Dominic uh, uh, asked about um, the whether the Mellow's um, noise is more realistic uh, because kind of people are more uh, certain about their, uh, how they rank candidates at the top and bottom, kind of more uncertain in the middle. So maybe uh, using that kind of noise model would change some of the results. Um, so in general, I, I mean, I, I agree that this is uh, always realistic in quotation marks, I would say. Um, uh, especially because, I mean, for example, or even going further here in the, in, the, in the Formula One setting, you also have different, I mean, different swaps should have different probabilities if you really go with a very precise setting because uh, they have different gaps in finishing time. Uh, so they are kind of, depending on the application, you can really speak of preference intensities and then should really also adapt your uh, your kind of noise model to this. Uh, so, so I agree, um, one, one could also look at, look at different um, or models trying to optimize maybe also for one specific application task. Although I have to say that we played a bit around with different types of models, not so much in terms of skewing the probability, but um, for example, also whether we make swaps or whether we have a global swap budget for the whole election or one swap budget basically for each vote doesn't really matter. Uh, so we have played a bit around with types of noise models and found all of the results to be highly correlated, but we haven't checked what happens with these top and bottom focus, different type of screwed probability distributions. Okay. Uh, then I had a question about uh, whether you have uh, considered adding random votes rather than changing votes. And because this could kind of model what happened if uh, some, some other eligible voters who did not vote in the election had voted. 
Um, yes, so we, or I think some people are planning to to uh, study something like this in the direction of participatory budgeting. Um, and I, I agree it would be as realistic or maybe depending on the uh, on the setting even more realistic. I think, or what would be a bit problematic here, at least to me would be what random votes or adding random votes mean would mean here. So I think if we really uh, would add uniformly at random sampled votes, um, then I would believe that most of the winners then would be pretty robust because everyone would then have the same probability of gaining and losing points. Um, so I think that kind of in 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 the long run, uh, we would just get the original outcome of the election again and again because we don't really we just add randomness on top and really don't change what what is already in there. Um, so yeah, yeah. Let's uh, take a fresh question that just came up. Uh, uh, so Joshua asks uh, uh, if you can comment on why the counting problem is uh, so hard for plurality. Um, so <laughs> um, it is. So I mean, the, 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 so the, on the formal level, it's a reduction from counting matchings in bipartite graphs. Uh, so the decision problem here is, of course, easy. Uh, so this is in P. But if we move to the counting problem, uh, then we get sharp P hardness here. And on an intuitive level, um, it's it's basic. Or I mean, what makes it difficult here is that you also have different. I mean, you, you also at the same time you need to ensure that your or you can view it as your kind of your candidate needs to reach as needs to have more points than everyone else, but also everyone else needs to have less points than your your candidate. So your winning candidates and kind of exactly how to distribute the points among all the other candidates is kind of the difficult task in the counting world. Yeah. I hope this this somewhat gave some intuition. Yep. Uh, maybe we. Oh, this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe we have time for uh, one or two more questions. So, Dominic, does that sound right? Yeah. Or... I mean, I can ask some of my other questions, which were: Have you considered other voting rules, in particular instant runoff voting, STV, which is sort of known to be robust to manipulation? And so it's interesting whether it's also more robust than all other rules. Uh, so we have we have done. I mean, I, I'm assuming, or I'm now talking about the single winner case. Um, yes. So we have done kind of extensive experiments with different voting rules in the single winner case. Um, so we have looked at. So the, the ranking is basically now from from most robust to least robust. Most robust is Border. Um, then comes Copeland. Then comes Buckland. Then comes STV, and then comes Peralty. So STV is rather on the low end in terms of robustness. And on a very high level, the reasoning here is if you have voting rules which kind of consider a large kind of take all or very much information concerning the election into account, like border really looks at everything, uh, then usually this results, results in a kind of very robust decision. Whereas if you have some some kind of threshold like behavior, like for Perlty, it's either zero or, or it's either you either get zero points or one points, then this usually leads to unrobust decisions or often leads to unrobust decisions. I mean, you also had this other question that was really interesting as to whether, what if you design a voting rule that uh, that's whose entire goal is to pick a winner who will be more robust. Uh, is that rule more robust? Kind of, can you design a rule that just by design will be very robust? I mean, that, that's of course possible. We can just always um, pick, uh, declare, I don't know, one fixed candidate as the winner. So just say, uh, candidate C1 always wins the election and then we have a very robust election, which is actually, I mean, kind of these types of questions are also interesting because they, they suggest that it's not always better. I mean, more higher robustness doesn't always mean it's better. The rule is better. It really depends on the specific election and you really sometimes have to look at the votes and think about, okay, do I think that there is enough information in these votes that the winner should be robust or is it actually something very close? For example, if you have just one vote and the reverse one, um, then this is kind of an election which contains very non-committal information, but the rules actually behave kind of differently in terms of their robustness already on these types of instances. But we haven't, we haven't thought about meta robustness, no. That's interesting. That kind of raises uh, the question of the uh, the kind of the parade of frontier. Let's say you are trying to your your eventual goal is to implement Boda, uh, but you want to use something that is even more robust than Boda, and you are trying to approximate the the optimal Boda score. This reminds me of uh, like the the work on uh, uh, using truthful uh, voting rules to approximate uh, like different scoring rules. Yeah, yeah. So I think, um, yeah, certainly one could one could look at this, but we haven't looked at it in this direction at all. I have to admit. 
And then I guess one last question we can take is, oh, I guess, okay, Rob's question just came in. So maybe we can take that. Uh, for point-based systems such as F1 uh, example, uh, is it true that the candidates with higher BODA scores are always more robust? Um, so usually for, uh, for, I mean, it's not always the case, surely not. Um, I mean, if we have the election winner, I mean, this one has initially the highest winning probability, um, but if we, so, I mean, uh, sorry. So if we if we look here, um, I mean, initially the one with the highest winning probability will always be the initial election winner, so the one which has the highest number of points. But then, um, which of the other so with the other drivers then kind of start to have the highest winning probability is not necessarily always the one which originally had the second highest number of points. I mean, it's always in these examples the case, uh, but there could be situations where you, for example, if you are very often ranked lastly then you can easily gain points by swaps because if you are involved in a swap, you will always gain a point. So this is very easy or this is very good for you to kind of get winning probability once some swaps are performed because all the swaps will be good for you. Um, so there are certain situations where, where this is not the case. Oh yeah, okay, now now is the <laughs> oh, border versus original scoring system. Okay, then I understood the question incorrect. We, we looked at, uh, sorry, we, we looked also at the predictability of the border score of the winners um, on these kind of robustness questions. There is a, a, a score correlation, but there are, we also observed many instances where this is not the case. So I would say in 80% of the cases, or maybe even 90, the border score gives you quite a good intuition, but there are also 10, 20% of cases where it's kind of gives you the wrong intuition. So Bill just posted a comment that's kind of a follow-up on uh, his previous question as well, uh, that uh, real elections incentivize risky behavior by those who are not in the lead. Uh, and I guess like this is also in relation to his previous comment where he noted that the, the uh, scoring vector used in the F1, it seems to kind of incentivize risky behavior because you suddenly get very high scores at the top ranks. Uh, so, uh, so Bill, what, what I meant was, was, you know, if you're going to encourage risky behavior, Behavior, the real elections are not going to behave like ideal probability distributions. They're going to, to necessarily involve a larger degree of luck, and that's going to make them less robust because people take chances if they see they're not winning. Yes, yes, but I think this is mostly, I mean, then I think if we would observe such non-robust elections, we should probably also adapt our noise model to this, right? And maybe say, I mean, maybe then also, again, speak of different distances or like give different distances, different probabilities, maybe. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think uh, thanks for answering the questions. I think we are uh, at the end of the questions and we can move to the breakout session. Thanks a lot for listening. Okay. So this will be a 10 minute break with random breakout rooms. If you'd like to join them and chat a bit and uh, see you again at 45 past. Uh, I was just going to say that the recording needs to be resumed. All right, so uh, now we are at our second talk by Jugal Gurk, who will tell us about his recent work on finding fair and efficient allocations of indivisible goods. Jugal, off to you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me and hello everyone. So let's get it started. I have only 20 minutes. So we consider the following allocation problem where we have a set uh, N of N agents and set M of indivisible goods. So each good must be given to exactly one agent. We cannot fractionally divide them. And we assume that agents have evolution functions. So VI is the evolution function of agent I. This is a set function. And we assume that uh, standard uh, assumption on the evolution function that like for empty bundle, the evolutions are, evolution is zero, like normalized and they are monotone. And these are the popular classes of evolution functions, like uh, commonly studied classes of evolution functions, like additive, restricted additive, growth substitutes, some modular subadditive. I don't need to go there. Uh, probably you already know about them. So the goal here is to partition these goods uh, among agents, which is uh, like we want a fair and efficient partition. So where Xi is the bundle given to agent I. So for this, like in the part one, we want to maximize the welfare, like for the efficiency. And for this, we consider the maximum Nash welfare, uh, which is the product of uh, agents' variations, which we want to maximize. Uh, it turns out that like the maximum Nash welfare is the rightmost notion or welfare function, 
when we when we want to achieve fairness and efficiency. It provides interesting trade trade off between fairness and efficiency. It is motivated by Nash bargaining, and uh, one nice property about Nash welfare is that it is scale free. That means that if we if the if we if we replace the valuation of any agent, uh, like scale it by lambda i for any positive lambda i, then the problem uh, does not change. The solution does not change. And there are many other nice properties about the Nash welfare which are which are which are very useful in the fair and efficient for fairness and efficiency. So we will see what we can do uh, for maximum Nash welfare in the part one. In the part two, we will talk about fairness, where our goal is to just achieve fairness, and we will consider uh, the quintessential fairness notion of NV freeness. And uh, since NV freeness cannot be achieved in case of uh, in the discrete setting, so we will look at the the most compelling uh, relaxation uh, known as EFX NV freeness up to any good. And in the third part, we will try to see if we can achieve both welfare and efficiency, uh, welfare and fairness simultaneously. So let's get it started. So for the welfare, so I'll start with the bad news. Uh, maximizing Nash welfare is a very hard problem. So it is NPR even for two agents with identical additive valuations. We can reduce the partition problem to this problem. So, and it is also APXR uh, even for restricted additive valuations. Uh, and uh, we know that it is hard to approximate within a factor of 1.069. So this is like uh, this is a hard problem. Uh, so let's let's first get started with the additive valuations. So 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 like uh, what we want, we want to maximize this uh, the the Nash welfare uh, and uh, subject to the the packing constraint. And if we if we relax them, so we get a natural convex relaxation. So so you look at this uh, objective function Nash welfare, which we want to maximize. If we take the logarithm of this function, then we get uh, this uh, nice concave function, which we want to maximize subject to this uh, uh, this uh, q. Uh, so this is like we can we can do it uh, like in polynomial time. Uh, but the question is how good is the <laughs> relaxation? Uh, unfortunately, the integrated gap is unbounded. So here is an example where like uh, there is a one very highly valued good. Uh, every agent like like agents are identical in this case. Uh, so if we look at the fractional optimum, uh, that will give the this uh, the first good uh, equally to all the agents, and uh, but that is not possible in the integral optimum. So we get an integrality gap of like which depends on m capital M, which like you can choose to be any any large number. So this concave rela uh, rela or convex relaxation relaxation is not very useful uh, even for additive relations. But in, in in any case, like uh, there has been a lot of uh, a lot of remarkable results. So the first breakthrough came in 2015 by Cole and Gajelis. They gave 2.89 approximation for this problem using a notion of spending restricted market equilibrium, uh, which for which the factor was later improved to two, and uh, some more results uh, came uh, using the uh, using the same technique. And then Anari, obviously, Karan Sabari and Singh uh, came up with a different approach uh, using real estable polynomials and give a uh, E approximation a randomized algorithm, uh, which is also generalized to a slight general evolution function than additive. And finally, like Bhavan Krishna Murthy and Vaish in 2018 gave a 1.45 approximation using a different market equilibrium approach. Uh, and uh, this is the best factor known even today. So this was for additive valuations, uh, which can be generalized a little bit uh, beyond additive, but like, but if we want to talk about gross substitutes, uh, submodular, subadditive, then these techniques unfortunately do not extend. So what to do when we want to like uh, solve the problem for more general valuations? So we need to develop new techniques. So for this, let's uh, uh, for this let's first understand its connection with the matchings. So this is our maximum Nash welfare problem, uh, the product of valuations, or if we can take the log, the sum of the logs. So one very nice observation about this problem is that if the number of goods are same as the number of agents, like M is same as N, we can easily see that like uh, if we want to maximize this product, then we need to give exact, at least one good to every agent, right? Otherwise, this product is anyway zero because we have normalized valuations, right? So when M is N, then everyone has to get exactly one good. So this is exactly like a maximum, finding a maximum weight perfect matching uh, in this uh, bipartite graph, which we can solve efficiently. So when the number of goods are same as the number of agents, then we can solve the maximum Nash welfare optimally, just like a matching algorithm. But uh, what happens when the number of goods are much larger than the number of agents, which will be the which will be the actually the main problem? So the question is, how good is the max weight matching? So we can see from this example that this can be very bad. 
So suppose this uh, first good is like high valued good uh, and, uh, and the rest of the M minus one goods, the left agent uh, likes equally, but the right agent, the boy like only likes the first uh, second good, but the, but the rest of the goods, so the valuation is zero. So if you just find the first matching, like the max wet matching, then what it will do is that it will give the first good to the left agent and the second good to the right agent because that will maximize the, uh, the Nash welfare or, or the, the, the matching, uh, the weight of the matching. And then after that, we can see that uh, the, there is no, no value for the right agent. So all the goods uh, must be given to the left agent. So the Nash welfare uh, we can achieve is at most a square root uh, of M square root of 2m but optimal is like m because like you can give the first good to the left, right agent and all the remaining goods to the left agent so the matching can just like can be very bad it cannot give you better than like uh, approximation factor in terms of m so it requires like approximation factor in terms of m and m is greater than m in any case there has been a, a lot of developments recently so like uh, initially like uh, in a, in a 2020 we came up with a with an approximation algorithm and log an approximation algorithm for some modular valuations, it is independent of M. So that was the, I think the uh, the main uh, main uh, result here. And then uh, then for the sub additive valuation, like uh, we we obtained like uh, there is a order and approximation, and it is also tight after the first algorithm. And then in 2021, like we came up with a constant vector approximation seven seven two for a valuation function, valuation classes called RADO. RADO is like gross substitutes, like it's almost like gross substitutes and which can capture weighted metroid and matchings and so on. And then uh, Lee and Wondrak, like uh, using the same approach came up with 380 approximation with some modular valuations. And then like uh, the approaches were very like closely related. So we decided to write a joint journal paper. And uh, of course, you know that like when you work in two different groups, like uh, things are very slow so like uh, we took almost two years uh, and sometimes the writing journal papers could be rewarding so from 380 we come down to 350 then 300 like uh, even in this paper they, they mentioned that like uh, 380 may not be the right bound but it cannot be less than 100 it has to be at least 100 but finally we came up with four, four approximation for some modular using a very simple approach so sometimes journal paper writing joint journal papers could be very very rewarding. So I'll mainly talk about this result. So so let's start with the first uh, like uh, the approach we came up with uh, in 2020 paper is a three phase algorithm. So what is the three phase algorithm? So in the first phase we find a matching, the maximum weight matching. Let's say H is the set of goods uh, which are allocated in the matching. We already know that we cannot commit to this matching, right? Because it cannot give better than, uh, like you cannot uh, uh, remove the dependency on M. So what we do, we we keep, we, we put uh, these uh, goods aside. Like uh, we just keep them aside. We don't allocate to anyone. Then we allocate the remaining goods. Whatever is in, in M minus H, the remaining goods we allocate using a very simple round robin algorithm. And let's say R is the output of such a, such, a, such an algorithm. You just run a round robin algorithm. Uh, let, let the agent pick their best good uh, among the unallocated goods and just allocate all the remaining goods. Then in the phase three, you bring back uh, the edge which you kept aside and then again find a matching. But now you have more information because RI is already given to agent I. So you want to maximize RI plus tau I where the tau is the matching you are interested in. So like uh, once we have allocated the low value goods, you then find the, the max weight matching using the, the set of high value goods. And we, we show that the, this gives analog and approximation algorithm for some modular evolution. Due to lack of the time, I will not go into like proof details like uh, for most of the results. Then uh, what happened in the, in the next paper, we just replaced the round robin algorithm with the concave relaxations of uh, like gross substitute, like which we call RADO. So concave relaxation, and then we apply some sparsification technique to like sparsify the fractional solution and then uh, do some rounding. And we show that like it can give a constant factor algorithm. The phase one and phase three remains the same. So in the phase one, you keep uh, N goods aside, which are high value goods, just find the first matching. And in the last phase, you just assign the, those goods back to the agents. 
then what lee and wonder did lee and wonder put uh, like uh, multilinear relaxation in the phase 2 because like we don't have concave relaxation for some modular evolution so they used the multilinear relaxation and they, then they used the iterated continuous gradient algorithm with randomized rounding they get a randomized algorithm which gives 3 at approximation and then finally we just like in the phase 2 just do a simple local search and we get a four approximation for some modular evolution so this is how the like techniques are evolved like uh, by very big hammer like uh, uh, multilinear relaxation and like uh, gritty continuous rounding and so on finally like it just like you can just do the simple local search and we get a deterministic four approximation for some modular evolution so let me just give you a little bit uh, uh, idea about this algorithm so for the local search what we do is that first we find a favorite good for every agent let's say l is the favorite good of agent i in the m minus h h you keep keep aside h you don't touch so let's say l is the favorite good of agent i in the in m minus h it can be same for multiple agents right it can be same for multiple agents then we we work with the modified evolutions we don't work with the original evolution we work with the modified evolution or in some sense like what what you can assume is that like li is given to agent i so let's assume that li is already given to agent i their favorite good in the in the m minus s you give them to agent i so the modified evolution is vi hat of s is vi of s plus li because we assume that li is already given to agent i so what is the property of this modified evolution that the empty bundle value is like vi of li because li is already given and the value of any good is at most twice of the empty bundle right because uh, we are we are assuming some modular evolutions so the evolution of any good is not more than twice of the empty bundle and empty bundle means like li is already given so this is this is the evolution function we we use so then what we do uh, we just do the local search local search is a very simple you start with any allocation you can give all the goods to one agent you can start with any allocation you keep improving the you just keep breaking this well, uh, the function the nash welfare with respect to the modified evolutions vi at so if by transferring one good from one agent to another agent can improve this function this potential function by 1 plus epsilon you do that very simple local search you just need to transfer one good from one agent to another agent and if you are not able to do that then you stop so so we just do this local search and maximize this uh, uh evolution uh, this welfare function with respect to the modified variation up to up to a factor of 1 plus epsilon and you ignore the goods in h completely because h is like not part of uh, this local search then we prove that for the modified variation you are not losing much like it's like a e approximation so by the way these factors are little loose in the presentation uh but uh, they are very very small constant so you are not losing a lot even if you want to maximize the nash welfare for m minus h for modified evolution you are not losing much using local search here note that if you don't use the modified evolution then you will not get any approximation for local search because even the number of goods are same as the number of agents then like any matching is a is a optimum right for local search right because you cannot make any bundle zero right you cannot transfer anything right if you work with the original evolution so that means like uh, using modified evolutions are very very important uh, to achieve this bound then uh, we just like uh, we just open up the uh, the 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 vi hat with vi so vi vi of ri plus li is same as vi hat of ri because li is given to agent i in vi hat and this also implies that like uh, because this is the vi hat as si star is the optimal nash welfare so that means like for any any allocation you can give any allocation of original evolution you are not losing uh, uh, like uh, more than uh, e approximation so this is uh, what we can achieve for the in terms of the original evolution the only trick is that uh, is that like you need to give li to every agent their favorite good in m minus s to every agent then we can achieve this very very nice uh, very nice relation now in the next part we bring back bring back in the phase 3 we bring back the items in h we allocate them again through the matching then we show that like uh, uh, there exists an item if you give in the matching there exists a matching where if you give pi i to agent i Uh, from the original set h then you are not losing much so we are very good actually this looks very good because like uh, because we are able to achieve very small constant factor 
uh, for the Nash welfare, the only problem is that LI we cannot give, right? Because LI is like, we, we have promised a lot, right? So this allocation is infeasible due to LI. Otherwise, like RI we can give, PI we can give, but LI is the is the problem here. But then we, 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 we show that like, uh, we are not very far because like, uh, because the key is that in the original matching, there exists an item for every agent, which is better than LI, right? Because like H will like Sigma is the original matching in the phase one, it will give an item to agent I better than LI. And by doing some uh, swaps, uh, we can still achieve almost the same factor. Like we don't lose much. So this is the analysis idea. Uh, and then uh, using this, we achieve like four approximation for the next welfare. So these are like uh, some open problems. Like, uh, so we know the hardness 1.069, even for restricted additive and the algorithm we know 1.45 and this same applies to additive. For the sub modular, we like, I just showed you uh, the brief uh, like uh, proof idea for the four approximation and the hardness is also known 1.5819. So there is some gap here, but the main problem is like weighted Nash welfare problem. So where like in the weighted Nash welfare problem, like agents are entitled, entitled with like weight WI. So we want to maximize the weighted Nash, weighted geometric mean. So this is the function we want to maximize. And our approx our algorithm also gives some approximation for this problem, but this is not a constant approximation for, for, for when like weights can be arbitrary, like in, in terms like when some agent has a very high weight. So finding a constant factor approximation for the weighted Nash welfare problem is like a, is a, like is a challenging open book problem. Okay, so in the next part, like let's talk about fairness. So NB freeness, as I said, is the quintessential fairness notion. The question is, it is always possible to be like achieve fairness through NB freeness. The answer is no, because like if there is only one good, then you cannot achieve NB freeness. And then, uh, like uh, then, the relaxation of NB freeness, uh, like uh, is like uh, the the most compelling fairness uh, relaxation is NB freeness up to any good, uh, where like you remove a, remove any good from the uh, from other agents bundle, then you should not envy. If I envy J, then uh, then after removing any good, any single good uh, from J's bundle, the NB vanishes. So this is the definition. And now the question is like, can we achieve EFX? And the answer is we don't know we don't know yet. So this is considered fair division biggest problem, and it was like even like in the flow trap gardens that it is highly non trivial even for three agents. But like but uh, we we know that it exists for three agents for additive evolutions, but it is not known for some modular or some modular evolutions even for three agents. And then since there are, there has not been much progress on uh, the EFX, then uh, then uh, then. Uh, then we started looking at real exceptions like EFX with charity, where you don't allocate all the goods. Most time I have, uh, okay. When you don't allocate all the goods, and then uh, like alpha EFX, where you just like uh, maybe apply a factor alpha here, and then um, maybe mix both of them, alpha EFX with charity. So there are like uh, tons of open questions here. The thing is that like uh, with uh, with alpha EFX, uh, we know 0.5 EFX for subadditive and 0.618 EFX for additive. So these are the results we know. And in the last part, can we achieve both of them simultaneously? And yes. So in the Karaganis, Gravin and Huang in 2019 showed that for edit evolution, we can achieve partial EFX allocations. Like you, you throw away some goods to the charity, which uh, where you don't lose more than a two factor of maximum Nash welfare. And we extended this result to sub edit evolutions where we can show that the we can achieve complete half EFX allocations with the by losing a factor of two in maximum Nash welfare. So, and then uh, recently like Feldman, Morris and Ponitka uh, improved these results uh, uh, by reducing the, uh, by improving to the best EFX guarantees. So what here, what this slide is saying is that we can achieve the best EFX allocation, what, whatever is known today with, uh, without losing much in the Nash welfare. So, so I think, uh, so with this, like if we can achieve better EFX, then probably the, the, these, these things can also be like uh, extended. And uh, I leave a lot of questions uh, for the goods. So like EFX, we don't know it exists for more than three agents additive, even for three agents with some modular. And for charity, like if you throw away N minus two unallocated goods, then uh, then we know EFX exists, but uh, can be reduced further beyond and uh, below N minus two. And uh, there are these open questions. So since I'm running out of time, so uh, thank you very much. All right.
Let's unmute and thank Jugal. Okay, so uh, there are a couple of questions uh, and maybe more might come in uh, while I ask them. So uh, I had a question about uh, this uh, modified valuations that you uh, showed in the first part of the talk. And so they resemble smooth Nash welfare where you basically uh, take the, the max value and then add it. Uh, so, and we know that, that maximizing just the smooth Nash welfare, uh, I mean, if you do it globally, we know that this is uh, also EF1 plus PO. And uh, so I'm wondering if there is any uh, relation between kind of, uh, uh, say, doing a local optimization to smooth Nash welfare from ground up versus kind of doing this approach. I've not worked on smooth Nash welfare. So like, uh, probably yes, because like, uh, because we are kind of smoothing the Nash welfare function, right, by giving Li to, uh, to agent I. Uh, I need to look at it, actually, when I was like, uh, I realized that this question will come up actually, <laughs> but uh, I have not worked on uh, smooth Nash welfare, so I think uh, I think none of my co-authors also. So so I think it may be possible to do something there with the, with the techniques we get. It is exactly know. this, except uh, here kind of you are only looking at this ally out of the the unallocated goods so far, uh, whereas kind right. of the the current at least in the literature the smooth Nash welfare approach has just been that. From the very beginning, uh, you add to each agent's valuation their their most uh, valued good, and then you just kind of maximize the product of these modified valuations. Uh, and at least if you do it globally, then we know that this gives EF1 plus PO. But uh, I don't, I, I'm not sure if anybody has looked at kind of local optimization of this. Uh, but here it's a bit different because you are already allocating H and then you are looking at kind of the smoothing the Nash welfare of the remaining. No, goods. we are not allocating H. We are just keeping them aside. We will allocate. Yeah, them. right, right. Yeah. So, but, but you are look kind of adding the favorite good out of the remaining goods. So it's a bit different. Uh, I but, think this is a very but, good question. I can maybe, maybe I want to look at it maybe this weekend. So yeah. can, like, can you tell, uh, send me the paper, like which proves E1 plus P for smooth Nash welfare? Sure. Um, I mean, it's, it's a simple proof. I'm, Anyway, I'll send you an email. Okay, after. I have not, uh, I have not, uh, I think I should have done it actually, but of course, like, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you are right, actually, this looks like a very good connection with this much nice welfare, yeah, maybe something can be said there, yeah, I, I will let you know, I will, I will, I, I'll work on, I'll think about it, this, yeah. Sounds good. Uh, Rohit has a question as to whether your algorithm gives a better than four approximation. No, 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 it doesn't, yeah, so this is like, we also, we, we thought about this actually. And in uh, so that that is very curious that like our algorithm does not give better for additive. So whatever we get for some modular, the same amount we get for additive. Maybe like by changing little bit here and there, maybe we get like uh, something better. Maybe e approximation two point eight, but not better than of course uh, whatever is known. But if we use the same algorithm, then uh, we don't know how to do better than four approximation. All right, uh, I think we are uh, at the end of the questions. So uh, do we, I guess we have uh, an uh, announcement for the, uh, by the way, thank you. Thanks both the speakers for, for coming here and, and uh, uh, telling us about these interesting developments. So one more time. And then uh, to all the participants, so the next seminar will be in June. Uh, that will, I believe it will be June uh, 9th, right, Dominic? Yeah, so uh, we'll have our next seminar on June 9th uh, and uh, the, you know, you'll find the details uh, uh, pretty soon on the Comsoc uh, seminar website. And um, I believe that is it for today. All right, so thanks everyone for joining and see you next month.